sharing and real action to arrest, prosecute, and punish the perpetrators. You're all aware that India fundamentally has been a peace-loving nation and society. That's what Dr. L.H. stood for. As the third largest contributor of peacekeepers to the United Nations, India has been instrumental in promoting the peaceful resolution of conflicts. India has consistently and peacefully helped various other developing nations to facilitate democracy in their respective countries. India helped conceive the idea of the United Nations Democracy Fund and along with the United States and remains a major funder, major donor to this fund. A democracy is made of its people, for its people, and by its people. Over the years, the various governments of India have placed the welfare of its people over any destructive external agenda. Even in 1948, when the Kashmir issue arose, our first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, took the issue to the United Nations so that a peaceful solution could have been sought. It was Nehruji's proposal that a plebiscite be held immediately to ascertain the wishes of the people. Though Nehruji's uh, decision to appeal to the UN has been seen by some within our country as a blunder that snatched diplomatic stalemate from the jaws of imminent military victory, I think that is unreasonable. After all, Pakistan could just as easily have raised the issue at the UN and it would have found some support. India has been consistently committed to finding a sustainable solution for Kashmir through peace talks, albeit so far unsuccessful. Unlike various developed nations that have invaded other countries without the approval of its people, India has refrained from resorting to violent measures unless the safety of its people is a threat. It understands that terror cannot be dealt with through terror. Unlike our neighbors, the army in India does not make foreign policy. That is the prerogative of an elected civilian government that is determined to engage in dialogue with its eyes open. Apart from being trained for combat, Army officials are taught to serve the nation and work for the greater good of its people. We saw the noteworthy, noble work done by the army during the recent floods in Uttarakhand, or the work that it has been consistently doing to preserve the integrity of our nation in Jammu and Kashmir or the Northeast. Apart from external organizations trying to create terror internally, Indian democracy has been a hotbed for internal terrorism too. In the last session of Parliament held in August this year, one of the rare functional days that the session saw, Minister of State for Home R.P. and Singh informed the Lok Sabha that the government has identified 65 terror groups active in the country, out of which 34 are in the state of Manipur. This is not something new for India. Since independence, various internal groups have threatened inter Indian democracy. From Naxalites to various independent, uh, pro-independence groups in North uh, East India, um, from groups spreading communal violence to those fighting for new states, Indian democracy, Indian democracy has had to tackle the issue of internal terror on an ongoing basis. Many of these groups have been predominantly leftist by nature. In April 2006, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh called the Maoist insurgency the single biggest internal security challenge ever faced by our country. Various other insurgency movements have been mushrooming in our nation. But one needs to understand that no terrorist organization, however well-motivated, well-trained, and well-financed, can hold a democracy to ransom. The whole emanation of the idea of India, to borrow Rabindranath Tagore's famous phrase, is the idea of a plural civilization, a civilization that has been created by generations of people of various backgrounds coming together to contribute to our history and a civilization capable of infinite resilience and fortitude. Nehruji spoke about India as a palimpsest, written over by new succeeding waves of people coming to this country, making the India we know today, and yet not erasing what has been written before. The high turnout of the recently held assembly elections in Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh and so on has sent out an unambiguous message to the Naxalites of the people of Chhattisgarh have immense, unshakable faith in the country's democratic polity. The Naxalite movement has gained steam in some of the poorest regions of our country. While India tackles poverty, one of the more interesting debates that has arisen since the specter of terrorism invaded the global consciousness is the one about poverty and terror. 
Some have argued, perhaps a bit simplistically, that terrorism is caused by poverty and that the eradication of poverty will lead to the elimination of terror. Certain development advocates have been particularly assiduous in purveying this line, no doubt, in, no doubt in reaction to the even more simplistic discourse of those who argue that terrorism is merely a form of evil, divorced from any understandable root cause that must be ruthlessly stamped out in a global war on terror. Repudiation was bound to come sooner or later from the growing band of scholars who study such things. It now has. The American economist Alan Kruger of Princeton and Czech professor Jitka Meletskova of Charles University in Prague have studied this question in the context of Palestinian support for terrorism and established from a diligent perusal of public opinion polls that the support for terror attacks on Israel is lower amongst the poor and unemployed people than amongst the relatively better off Palestinians, students, professionals, and merchants. The same is true, they showed, for supporters of the Hezbollah in Lebanon and of the extremist, even racist, Gush Emunin in, 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 uh, in Israel. So when doctors and engineers participated in bomb assaults in London and Glasgow, Kruger was not surprised. He told the Wall Street Journal, each time we have one of these attacks and the backgrounds of the attackers are revealed, they should put to, the re put to rest the myth that terrorists are attacking us because they're desperately poor. But this misconception doesn't die, unquote. My London-based Indian commentator friend, Salil Tripathi, a thoughtful analyst of such uh, issues, concurs. He wrote in the New Statesman, some 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11, 11 September 2011, came from wealthy families in a prosperous country, Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden's background was famously opulent. His deputy, Ayman al-Zawahiri, is an affluent pediatrician. There are many good reasons to eliminate poverty, but we should not expect terrorism to decline as a result." Unquote. And yet I'm tempted to say, not so fast, my friends. Of course, eliminating dire poverty will not in itself solve our problems in this age of terror. The pilots of 9-11 were not poor. Not only were they educated and reasonably well off, their pilots' licenses could have guaranteed them comfortable middle-class lives. But those like me who focus on the factors that make terrorism possible are not drawing so simple a causal connection as to suggest that poverty causes terrorism. My own argument is a little more complicated. It is first that poverty helps create the conditions that provide succor and sustenance to terrorists who can scarcely work in isolation. They need support, bases, safe havens, supplies, allies, and they find these amongst a general population that is broadly alienated from the world order or the national political order that the terrorists are attacking, an order that denies them hope. Yet it is not just poverty at work here. Those who support, applaud, and orchestrate terrorism are not driven solely by a sense of economic injustice. A sense of oppression, of exclusion, of marginalization also gives rise to extremism. And this comes particularly to people who see no other hope of overturning the political dispensation that alienates them. Second, terrorists need a rationale for their actions, a narrative of injustice to inspire their poems, the suicide bombers and their ilk, and to win broad sympathy for their cause. That rationale is most easily found in tales of poverty and suffering, seemingly created by an unjust world order. If we can eliminate poverty, we would significantly dent that rationale and dilute the support base for terrorism. Of course, it's sadly true that other factors will continue to spawn terrorists. My friend Nasr Hassan, a Pakistani former colleague of mine at the United Nations, wrote a remarkable article for The New Yorker in 2001 in which he suggested that indignity, political humiliation, and a sense of desperation about the possibility of bringing about political change were the main motivations for Palestinian would-be suicide bombers. She came to this conclusion by interviewing several terror recruits in Israeli prisons. Terrorism is a weapon of asymmetrical warfare. It is the instrument of the weak against the implacable power of a state system that enrages them. It's been used by anarchists in 19th century Russia, Irish nationalists in 20th century Britain, Basque separatists in 21st century Spain, and by the advocates of Tamililam in Sri Lanka. So ending poverty will not end terror, but it will make terrorism that much more difficult to promote. If we can create a world in which people have access, and which all people have access to, at a minimum, 
the opportunity to live beyond starvation, to receive an education, to have realistic hopes for a better future, including the possibility of some say in their own political arrangements, we might be able to stop the lugubrious litany of reflections on terror every year. That would be a possible goal to work for in India and around the world. Terrorism is, after all, an assault on the common bonds of humanity and civility that tie us all together. Our commitment to democracy should make us stronger in the face of terror, and we should not relent until the scourge is extinguished. I believe strongly that we must work to create a world in which Indians can prosper in safety and security, a world in which a transformed India can, pray, can play a worthy part. This is a time in our national evolution when we must rethink the assumptions of our political philosophy and rise to the need to refurbish our institutions with new ideas. An India led by rational, humane, and open-minded open ideas of itself must develop a view of the world that is also broad-minded, accommodative, and responsible. That will be in keeping with the aspirations that Nehruji launched us on when he spoke of our tryst with destiny. As we embark on the second decade of the 21st century, the time has indeed come for us to redeem his pledge. As a nation with 65% of, of the population below the age of 35, half the population below the age of 25, India is ready to take on the world. Let me say to the young Indians here today, Indians like you, unlike those of my generation, are likely to spend a lot of your adult lives interacting with people who don't look, sound, dress, or eat like you. Unlike your parents, you might well work for an internationally oriented company, have clients, colleagues, or investors from around the globe. Increasingly, you're likely to holiday in far-flung destinations. The world into which you grow will be full of such opportunities that cross borders. But it'll also be a world of threats from across borders, of terrorism, but also internet viruses, extreme climatic disasters, swine flu. To cope with them all, we will need to be open to the world and also on our guard. We were insufficiently on our guard this day five years ago. Of course, India can recover, has recovered from the physical assaults against it. It's a land of great resilience that has learned over arduous millennia to cope with tragedy. Within 24 hours of an earlier Islamist assault in Mumbai, the stock exchange bombing in 1993, Bombay's traders were back on the floor they burned out computers forgotten, doing what they used to do before technology had changed their trading styles. After the 2006 bombings that shook the lifeline of Mumbai, the local trains, you chose to step out and go to work the very next day. When the terrorists have tried to create panic in any corner of the nation, the spirit of our people has consistently defied their purpose. Bombs and bullets alone cannot destroy India because Indians will pick their way through the rubble and carry on, as they have done throughout history. But what can destroy India is a change in the spirit of its people, away from the pluralism and coexistence that has been our greatest strength. That these tragic events never led to the demonization of the Muslims of India was vital. For if it had done so, the terrorists would have won. For India to be India, its gateway to the multiple Indias within and the heaving seas without must always remain open. Today, we must reaffirm the human spirit, the spirit of Mumbai. The phrase never again has been used elsewhere. Today, it resonates in every Indian heart. Let us mourn what happened in Mumbai five years ago. Let us pay homage to all the victims of this senseless outrage and tribute to those who overcame the horror. But at the same time, let us strive together to ensure that it never happens again. I hope all of you present here today, especially the youth, pledge to not let the spirit of India in you die, as it is your spirit that keeps the country going. We will create a safe, prosperous, and just India. In doing so, we will ensure that the politics of hope will always prevail over the purveyors of hatred within and outside our country. India will be a beacon of strength and stability 
for the rest of the subcontinent. That would be the best way to honor and cherish the memory of the late Dr. Hirnandani. His beloved Mumbai is far greater than any nightmare these terrorists could have inflicted. Let this day be marked not merely by reflection and mourning, but by also celebrating and reaffirming our faith in the idea of India. Five years ago, we lowered our heads in mourning. Today, let us raise them again in hope. Thank you, and Jai Sir, I, I only want to say that I've heard a lot of oratory on this platform and on this stage, but I have never heard what I'm hearing today. It was fabulous. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's absolutely outstanding. Uh, I, I, I think I want to speak for a minute or two. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my young friends, I think if we can emulate that quarter of 1% of what Dr. Shashi Tharoor represents today in terms of the future of India, I think we will have achieved a lot. Sir, thank you so much. I want to say thank you for coming to Mumbai every year. In the last five years on this day, every single year from 2611, he is the person who has always come to Mumbai and paid homage to an incident which represents terrorism of the worst kind. But I've never ever heard about terrorism in a manner that I've heard today, sir. I want to tell you that the descriptive of description of terrorism, its causes, the reasons where we should not really misunderstand and think only poverty could be a cause of this terrorism, that terrorism is a far deeper malaise that we need to face and fight. And I am extremely proud that you have shown that North light in terms of the direction that we need to go and that we need to work hard as a country, as a city, and we need to celebrate this day when you have shown us this direction in which we will all go. And I promise you that all these young people will not let you down. And I am certain, very certain, that your lecture here today has turned my mind and heart and I'm sure that Dr. Hiranandani up there will be proud to see that people of this, sit this city have really heard from you today this wonderful lecture which forms the inauguration of his speech. Thank you so much, everybody, and especially to you, Dr. Veluka, all the dignitaries, Sunanda, all the other people in the audience. Thank you very, very much for being here today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and look forward to see you again soon. Thank you so much, one and all, for being here. We'd just like to end on an interview, an answer that Dr. L.H. Hiranandani had given on his 90th birthday, where he was asked, what is that one message he would like to give the younger generation? And he said, work hard, have ambition in your mind. Have devotion, and you will succeed. God comes to your help, and I have been a living legend and a living example of that. Ladies and this was Dr. L.H. Hiranandani's words that resonate in all our minds and we will make sure that we work to our fullest and make his dreams come true. Thank you all once again for being here and we hope to see you all for the next lecture series. Thank you. I could request everyone to please rise for the national anthem. Jana gana mana adhinayak jaya hai भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा 
तब शुभ नाम जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गण मंगल नायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू वंस अगेन एंड वी होप टू सी यू ऑल द नेक्स्ट टाइम थैंक यू एंड हैव अ गुड डे